This lecture is over section 2.4 in the Lock 5 textbook. This section in the textbook is about describing the relationship between a categorical variable and a quantitative variable. In particular, you, we are going to spend a bit of time talking about how you visualize the relationship between a categorical variable and a quantitative variable. And we're going to do this principally while using a box plot. So what are the key concepts in this section? I think the most important concept is understanding a box plot, understanding the data that goes into a box plot, understanding the relationship between a box plot and a five number summary, and understanding how we can talk a lot about the distribution from a box plot. Then what we're gonna dive into is we're gonna talk about how we can understand the relationship between a categorical variable and a quantitative variable. And we're gonna do this through side-by-side -side plots and comparative statistics, where basically what we're doing is we're looking at a quant the quantitative variable for each of the two categories separately, but making comparative statements about the two groups, or three groups, as may be the case. So what is a box plot? So if you're, you may have learned about a box plot in, in high school, but if you didn't, that's okay. Last time we talked about a, the five number summary. So the five number summary contains the numbers minimum value, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the max. So these five numbers are going to be very important values that are going to correspond uh, that are going to be visualized in our box plot. So as a reminder, the first quartile corresponds to the 25th percentile, the median is the 50th percentile, and the third quartile is the 75th. So they split the data into various parts these quartiles do, right? The first quartile splits the data into the lower quarter of the data and the upper three quarters of the data. The median splits the data in half, and the third quartile does the opposite of what the first quantile does. So this data, this information will go into our box plots. So what else is contained in a box plot? Well, we're gonna have a numerical scale. So we're gonna just have some uh, scale either on the X or the Y axis. Typically, we're gonna see it on the X axis. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a box. So if we've got some scale here, let's say it's our X and we've got various values along that axis there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a box that stretches from the first to the third quartile. So here's our box right now. It goes down to Q1 and goes up to Q3. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide the box. We're gonna draw a line that divides the box at the median. So maybe the median is right here. So maybe that's the median. It's important to note that the median does not need to be um, directly in the center of these boxes. If the data are skewed, the median won't be in the center. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to draw a line from, from both the first quartile and third quartiles out to the most extreme value that we would, um, we would consider the most extreme value without considering it an outlier. So maybe it goes down to here, maybe this one is longer. So why would, why would one of these lines go out further than another? Well, we'll talk about how these lines are created, but basically they go out to the minimum values or the maximum values. So this could be the minimum value that was observed in the data set. And maybe the maximum value that was observed was actually over here. Now this line is going to stop at this value right here, at some place right there, and that's going to be the most extreme value that we would not consider an outlier. However, this point over here would be an outlier, and it would also correspond to the maximum value in our data set. This value right here would correspond to the minimum value, and you can see right here we now have all those pieces from the five number summary in our plot. So let's look at a real example rather than just this fictitious box plot I've drawn. So this data is going to come from the use of uh, fatal force by police officers in the United States. So this is a data set that the Washington Post started collecting in January 1st of 2015. And so what it does is it looks at every fatal shooting in the United States by a police officer. It includes information on the various victims of the shootings, um, including their race, uh, the circumstances of the shooting, whether they were armed, as well as whether or not they were experiencing a mental health crisis. Now, this data set, it should be known as only looking at shootings in which a police officer in the line of duty shoots and kills a civilian. No, and it's not looking at anything else, like whether or not somebody was killed during being uh, while they were in police custody or they were shot by off-duty uh, police officers or anything else. So at the time of when I downloaded this data set, which was very recent, there were 5,645 fatal shootings since January 1st of 2015, 
according to that database. And if you want to work out the math, it's probably about three to four shootings per day since January 1st. So three to four people are, are killed every single day by police officers in the United States since January 1st, 2015, based on this database. Now, let's look at the age of the victims of the fatal shootings. So that information is presented right here in this box plot. We see on the x-axis is the age of the victim. The y-axis doesn't really make any sense here, so that's kind of why there's no values corresponding to it. So let's break down this plot. The first thing you should notice is the, the line in the middle. That's the median, which I'll represent by the M. Now note it is not drawn directly into the middle uh, of the box, as I told you it wouldn't be. This is the Q1, and then here's Q3. <clears throat> so we know right as well that this value down here is the minimum value, and we know that this value right here is the maximum value. So we can get all of that information right away. We can also see that all of those are outliers. We haven't quite figured out yet how you determine what an outlier is from a box plot, but those are outliers. The next thing you'll notice is that these lines are not the same length. And they're not the same length because uh, this, the lines will only extend to either the minimum value or, the, or um, the maximum value if it hasn't encountered an outlier yet. So in this situation, we see that we hit the minimum value before we have values that are considered extreme. Whereas if we go um, to the higher age, we hit this, um, the, this value that is not extreme based on some, some algorithm, which I will tell you momentarily. And then we have a bunch of values that ex extend that, including the maximum value. So one common mistake is for students to think that this value right here corresponds to the maximum, and it doesn't. If there are outliers in your data, it most certainly does not. It's going to correspond to this value here. You can have outliers on both sides. So you could have outliers that are to the left and outliers that are to the right. They, they don't, your plot doesn't necessarily have to go to a minimum and a maximum value um, like this. Um, by that, I mean in the sense that you could have minimum values. Your minimum value could be an extreme outlier, just like in the case of this plot here that the maximum value is an extreme outlier. So that allows us to break this down a little bit. Um, the median is located at, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 or so, maybe a little bit less, maybe, maybe let's actually, let's say that that looks like that's maybe 38. We're just going to ballpark this. This is like, say, oh, I don't know, 26 is where the first quartile is. Maybe Q3 is at 46. The minimum looks like it's maybe around five, maybe six or seven, somewhere around there. And the maximum looks like it's around 90. So with all of this information, we can calculate the range because that's going to be the maximum value minus the minimum. So that's 90 minus 5. So maybe the range is about 85. And the IQR, the interquartile range, is going to be Q3 minus Q1. So it looks like that's going to be 46 minus 26. And then that's 20. So we have all of that information just contained within this plot. A really good exercise would be to take a five number summary and try to draw a, uh, a, uh, a box plot from that because this information can go to some extent back and forth. So what does this box plot tell us about the distribution of this variable in terms of the shape? So let's start with shape. So we can see that the median is a little further to the left in the box than it is to the right. So that means that uh, there's going to be more data that's occurring over a larger space that's above the mean in the box. And we can also see that this tail and the outliers are over a much wider range than the values below the median. Therefore, this, this distribution could be described as being right skewed. And we can see that because both this tail is much longer and the fact that this uh, upper that this middle 25% is over a larger area than this, right? This, this is larger than that. What can we say about the center? Well, we can say that the median looks like it's about 38. We can also say that the mean is higher than the median in this plot. And we can base that on the fact that it's right skewed. What can we say about the variability? Well, we can't say anything about standard deviation because we don't know how to calculate that from a box plot. 
But we do know that the range looks to be about 85 and the IQR looks to be about 20. Those are both measures of variability. So make sure if you're asked to talk about the variability of a box plot, you mention those statistics. And what, do we, what can we say about outliers? Well, we can say that we have some. Looks like we have greater than 10. I don't necessarily expect you to count them, but you can see that we have, it looks like quite a few over here. So how did we determine that those values were outliers? Well, we use this thing called the IQR method. And so basically it's gonna be the first quartile minus one and a half times the IQR. And any value that falls below that is considered an outlier. It's also gonna be calculated as the third quartile plus one and a half times the IQR. So we need to figure out what this value is right here. How do we calculate? We need, we need to calculate the IQR in order to calculate that. Then we can add that to the first third quartile and then we can subtract it from the first. So here's our five number summary. I'd encourage you to just look at this and redraw the box plot if you can redraw it. And in fact, maybe we'll do that right now after we calculate our IQR um, and our, uh, our length of our tails. So the IQR is going to be 46 minus 27, which is 19. One and a half times that is going to be 29.25. So we can now figure out where our outliers are going to be because we have all this information. And in fact, we can, we can draw the box plot from this information right here. So let's draw it right now. Our median is going to be 35. So we know that that will be at 35. Our, our third quartile is at 46. So it's 11 up. And then it looks like our first quartile is at 27. So it's like nine down. So we wanna make sure that it's not quite even. We can, we can see that there. That's Q1, M, Q3. Great. So now we need to figure out how long the tail should be. So the, the tail for the first, uh, the one going to the left of Q1 should be Q1 minus 29.25. So it should be 27 minus 29.25, which is gonna equal negative 2.25. Well, what we said is we're gonna draw the line either to that value or to the minimum value. And it looks like, and whichever one is greater, and in this case, we see the minimum value is stops at six. So we're gonna draw that to there, and we'll say that this value right here is six. So this is the min, and that's at six, okay? Now we'll draw it, we'll do the same thing for the upper tail. We'll add it to the Q3, and that is going to be 46 plus 29.25, which is gonna equal 75 and a quarter, oops. So we can draw this tail now out to 75 and a quarter. And the reason we know we can draw that to 75 and a quarter is that we have a maximum value that's greater than that. So that means we know that there's at least one outlier over here and that's the maximum value. So we could draw this box plot from this five number summary. Now we don't know how many outliers there are, but we do know from this box plot that there's, I mean, from this table, that there's at least one outlier that would be labeled in a box plot. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. This is, I think, pretty important information. So now that we've learned what a box plot is, let's see how we can use a box plot to compare the relationship between a categorical and a quantitative variable. And what we're going to do is we're going to do these side-by-side -side plots. Um, and what I mentioned initially was that Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to, for each category of the categorical variable, for each group, we're going to look at the distribution of the quantitative variable. And we're going to do that using maybe a histogram or a dot plot or a box plot. And I think it's important for you to learn how to do this with all three. So we're going to look at the situation where we'll have all three. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a box plot of the age of the victim of a police uh, victim of a fatal shooting by their biological sex. We see from the legend over here that the bottom box plot, the pink one, corresponds to the females, and the top one, of this sort of tealish color, corresponds to the males. Uh, so that right there, we can already talk about. Now, whenever we're looking at box plots, and whenever we're looking at things in general, I'm going to want you to make comparative statements. So how can we compare these two groups? 
Well, we can say for one thing that the median of the females, this value right here, is greater than that of the males. So we can say that the center for the females is greater than the center of the males. We can also talk about the shape of the distribution here. We can see that for the males, it really looks like that this upper tail is stretched out over a much larger area than it is for the females, uh, as well as the box uh, that the median is located a little bit further to the left in the box for uh, the males, uh, whereas for the females, it's somewhat, somewhat uh, in the center. So we could definitely say, looking at this plot, that the male's distribution is more right skewed than the female's. But we don't necessarily know how much more right skewed. And I would say, looking at this box plot, it's not actually easy to tell if the female um, distribution is right skewed or not. It could be, it could be roughly normal with a, uh, or roughly bell-shaped with one outlier over here. So that's sort of getting us this the sense of the, the uh, distribution the shape of the distribution. We can also talk about the variability. So whenever we're looking at a plot like this, we could calculate IQR or range. We can see that the range for, for the males is going to go from our minimum value in our data set to our maximum value, which I think was 91 to, this was 91 and this was six. So that range is 85. And then for females, it looks like it's about, maybe that's 85. And then it looks like here it goes down to maybe 15. So maybe their range is 70. And then the IQRs of both of these are actually really similar. So I would say these have very similar IQRs, but that the range for the male is greater than the range for the female. Finally, I would say that there are more outliers for the males than there are for the females. Certainly there's more dots up here than there are for females, but both distributions have outliers. This is uh, the same plot, uh, the same data, but represented instead of a box plot by using a histogram. So probably on a quiz, I will give you both a box plot and I'll give you either histogram or a dot, by, or a dot plot in order for you to have a couple bits of information to kind of make your uh, decisions about the shape. Now looking at this, it's, it's a little unfortunate because the female group is uh, or, or I, should, I should step back here and say one very noticeable thing here is that we can see that males are much more likely to be the victims than are females. And we can tell this because they both have the same y-axis and the, just the count of the number of victims is much, much smaller for females than males. So that makes it on a plot like this kind of difficult to talk about the female distribution independent of the male one because this y-axis has basically shrunk the female group. But let's, uh, specifically looking at this, let's talk about the shape of the distributions because that was a little bit harder to see in the box plot. So for males, I would say that the shape is, it's still pretty right skewed. It actually looks somewhat normal distribute, normally distributed, but I would say it has a little bit of a right, uh, of a right skew. The female distribution, however, which is kind of hard to see, I'd say uh, maybe, maybe that's nor maybe that's bell shaped. Maybe it's maybe it's right skewed. It's really hard to tell. Um, but either way, in, in both cases, we would imagine that probably these data would in general be right skewed because we'd expect that probably people in their 20s and 30s are more likely in general to be shot by police officers because they're probably more likely to have encounters. So I want to stress this. Whenever I'm giving you a box plot, or a dot plot or a histogram, and they're side by side like that, I want you to make comparative statements. I want you to compare the two distributions on their shape. Are both distributions right skewed? Are they both left skewed? Is one skewed and one symmetric? Are the centers the same? If they're not the same, which center is higher? Is it a group A, is it group B? Do they have the same variability? Talk about the range, talk about the IQs, and, and finally, talk about the outliers. Are there more outliers for one group than there for another group? I always want you to mention these four things when you're looking at a plot. So let's do one more example of this. Here, I've got data on the cholesterol level of, of this is a study looking at cholesterol level. And it was looking at the cholesterol level of people that are current smokers versus the cholesterol level of people that are uh, who quit smoking uh, five years ago. So we can see that this plot on the top is going to be the ex-smokers. The plot on the bottom is the smokers. 
and our x-axis is going to be the cholesterol, which is in milligrams per deciliter. And what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to talk about the shape, the center, the variability, as well as are there any outliers. So first, let's look at the shape. So looking at the X smokers, it's a little hard to, to see a shape of this distribution, but if I were to just try to draw something over it, and that's kind of how I'd encourage you to kind of do it, maybe it would look like that. And I don't see any indication that this is skewed. So I might describe the shape as being symmetric, and maybe it's bell, maybe it's bell-shaped. It's definitely not really skewed. Now, if we look then at the smokers, Maybe it looks like this. Maybe you could make the case that the smokers are skewed, but I would still probably say to me that that data looks pretty symmetric and pretty bell-shaped. So I would sort of think about that. Now, uh, something else you may notice looking at this is there's just not much data here. And when your groups are very small like this, so I think in the case of the X smokers, there's 33 dots. And for the smokers, there's 43. It's really hard to talk about the shape. So just give it your best shot and make sure you're just justifying why you think it looks like it does. I don't see any strong evidence of a tail. That's why I'm describing it as symmetric and bell-shaped. So that's the shape, right? I would say that they're both symmetric and bell-shaped. So let's look at the center. Well, in this situation, we don't have the number, right? Um, but it looks like maybe the center is... Oh, geez, I don't know, maybe maybe somewhere around here, maybe like 240. Maybe the center's at 240, the median. And then if we look over here for the smokers, we have this really big pile up here. But then we still see that there's quite there's quite a few values over here, so maybe maybe it actually is at 250 for here. So maybe we'd say that the median's at 250. And mind you, we're just, we're just making an educated guess here. We can actually calculate the median, of course. We can actually calculate the mean. But what you want to be thinking about this is sort of in an exploratory fashion. Next, we'll talk about variability in this plot. So if you look at this plot, probably the easiest way to talk about variability is in terms of range. So we can see for the X smokers, it looks like the range goes down to about maybe 140. And it goes up to maybe 3, 310. Uh, the minimum and the maximum value. So we can say here that the range is about 170 for that group. And then the range down here would be, say, 350 to about 150, so maybe 200, right? So I'm talking about this value right here and this right here, so 150, 350. So we can say that the range is greater for the smokers than it is for the ex-smokers. Do we see any outliers? I would say for the X X smokers, the answer is no. But for the smokers, I think you could make a case that 350 is an outlier. Um, any of these values are, I mean, that value in particular is a pretty high value for cholesterol. So Now, finally, we're going to look at, we're going to compare the, these variables, but using comparative statistics. So we're going to actually look at numbers. And so when I say statistics, remember, it's just any number that summarizes some quantity in the sample, which we're going to use to estimate the population. So we've got this table here. It contains the, the X smokers group is on the first row. The smokers group is on the second row. Uh, their, each group sizes is listed in the first column. Then their mean, their standard deviation, the minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and then the max. So from here, we can calculate the range. We could calculate the IQR. Um, we can also talk about the differences in means. And the differences in means is going to be a really important thing that we're interested in later on. Because when we start doing randomization tests and we start doing bootstrapping and then t-tests, we're going to want to be able to know, well, are, do these two groups differ? And that's going to be a test of the mean. So we can test this using the sample means. And so to calculate this, the difference in means, we would use the sample means. So that would be x bar of, say, the smokers minus x bar of the x smokers, and that would be 237 minus 98, 0.98, excuse me, not minus, minus 23.06, and that's going to equal 
4.29 milligrams per deciliter. And that's going to be an estimate for mu of the, the population mean for smokers minus the population mean for ex-smokers. That's going to, this is an, this, uh, this one right here is an estimate for this, okay? <clears throat> and using this table, we can, of course, talk about variability. We can see that based on the standard deviation, the ex-smokers have a much greater standard deviation than the smokers, so they have greater variability. Um, we can also see that it looks like the ranges are actually pretty similar, the max is in, uh, based on the maximum and the minimum. And it uh, looks like the IQR is a little bit smaller for the ex-smokers than it is for the smokers. I'm just roughly looking at these numbers by comparing, taking the max minus the min minus the max, and then Q1 minus Q3. So I hope that this makes sense to you. Uh, if you have any questions, please come to class with them, and I'd be happy to talk about uh, how we go about uh, either interpreting box plots, looking at side-by-side -side plots in order to understand the relationship between a quantitative variable and a categorical variable, and how we break down a comparative statistics table in order to do the same thing.